with us this evening. <coughs> I am Stephanie Nuttall, your moderator for this event. Our co-sponsors for tonight are AAUW Winona Chapter, Project Fine, the Women's Resource Center of Winona, the Winona State University Social Work Students, American Democracy Project, and Student Senate and Students United. We are pleased to welcome those of you in our live audience and citizens who may be watching at home. We also want to thank the City of Winona for allowing us to hold this educational forum in their council chambers. For those of you watching at home, we have a call-in phone number where you can provide us with questions for the candidates. The call-in phone number is 457-8280. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan volunteer organization organized at the local, state, and national level to encourage citizens to become educated and participate in government. While we as a league do study and take stands on issues, we do not endorse or support political parties, candidates, or tell the voters how to answer referendum questions. We will read statements from candidates who are unable to attend the forums. This forum is intended to provide the voters with information so they can make an educated choice on the ballot. The views expressed in this educational forum are those from the candidates. We do encourage our members as individuals, as we encourage each of you, to get involved in your community. Our timekeeper for this evening is Sue Cooper. For the 2016 forums, the League of Women Voters Winona has adopted the participation policy as approved by the Minnesota League of Women Voters 2016 board. The major change for all forums allows for inviting all candidates for an elected office. If only one candidate chooses to participate, the forum will still be held. We will read statements submitted by candidates who may be unable to attend a forum. Copies of the participation policy have been provided to the candidates and copies are available this evening for the public. I will review briefly and highlight some of our ground rules for this forum. The audience is expected to be courteous to the candidates and good listeners. This is a live cable TV broadcast. The audience is asked not to express support or concern during the forum and to hold their applause until the end of the forum. We would like to remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones and pagers. Pictures and recordings which are not authorized by the League of Women Voters are prohibited. This forum will be recorded, may not be edited, and must be broadcast in its entirety and in accord with all FCC regulations. The candidates may not use the educational forum recording in campaign ads or literature. During the forum, we do ask the audience present and our TV listeners to write down their questions or call them in at 457-8280. The League of Women Voters and co-sponsors will sort the questions for the moderator. The moderator will ask the questions. The League of Women Voters will determine the questions to be asked, and attempts in good faith will be made to cover all areas of interest expressed by the audience. The candidates will not know the questions in advance. Questions that are hostile, partisan, embarrassing, inappropriate, or of a personal nature will not be asked. Questions on similar topics may be grouped, and question phrasing may be modified by either the question sorters or the moderator. All questions will become the property of the League of Women Voters. Candidates will strictly observe time limits on their responses. The timekeeper will hold up cards to indicate time is about to expire, and once the stop card is displayed, candidates will stop at the end of their current sentence. Opening statements will be given two minutes per candidate, Questions they will have one minute to respond to, and they will be allowed to present a one-minute closing statement. Before we have candidates respond to the public questions, we have invited Sandra Sukla, Winona County Auditor-Treasurer, who is also the Winona County Election Official, to read the Minnesota Legislative 2016 referendum question on legislative salary process. She will also explain how votes are counted on a constitutional referendum question in Minnesota. Sandra will not at this time answer any questions or provide any opinions on the issue. However, at the end of the forum, the League of Women Voters moderator will entertain up to three questions for Ms. Sukla on the voting process if the public present requests further information. <coughs> the candidates present have also been apprised about the referendum question as a possible forum topic. Ms. Sukla? Good evening, everyone. I am Sandra Sukla, the Winona County Auditor Treasurer and the Election Administrator for Winona County. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for inviting me to this event and thank all of you in attendance and our home audience and welcome to those participating in this evening's forum. 
I've been asked to read the referendum question that is on the general election ballot, as well as explain how votes are counted on such questions. This year's general election will be held on Tuesday, November 8th, and the following question will appear on ballots all across the state of Minnesota. It reads, Shall the Minnesota Constitution be amended to remove state lawmakers' power to set their own salaries and instead establish an independent citizens-only council to prescribe salaries of lawmakers? Filling in the oval next to the word yes is a vote in favor of the amendment. Marking the oval next to the word no is a vote against the amendment. But here's the interesting part. Not voting at all on a constitutional amendment is also counted as a no vote. Failure to vote on a constitutional amendment will have the same effect as voting no on the amendment. In very simple terms, if we had 10 voters and four voted yes, three voted no, and three chose not to vote at all, on that question, the amendment would still fail to pass because not enough of the 10 voters had voted yes. Now between 1858 and 1898, things were different. The Minnesota Constitution required that a proposed amendment be approved by a simple majority of both chambers of the legislature and then ratified by a simple majority of the voters at the next general election. A simple majority vote obviously being defined as yes versus no on a proposed amendment. So whichever vote had the greater number won. But in, starting in 1898, the Minnesota Constitution still required a simple majority vote for a constitutional amendment at the legislative level, but now it needed to be ratified by a majority of all the electors voting at the election. Therefore, even though, though more votes might be cast to approve an amendment, than the votes cast to reject the amendment, the amendment may still fail because a majority of all the voters at the election did not cast a yes vote. Uh, in closing, I guess I'd just like to say that once again, the general election is going to be held on Tuesday, November 8th. The majority of polling sites in Winona County open at 7 a.m. and they remain open until 8 o'clock p.m. Absentee voting begins on Friday, September 23rd, and you can vote either in person at the Government Center here in Winona County, located at 177 Main Street, or you can vote by mail. The Auditor's Office, as well as the Minnesota Secretary of State's website, are great resources for questions relating to elections. I encourage everyone to be an informed voter by attending forums such as this, reading and listening to the media interviews that will be coming out this fall. And if a candidate should happen to be campaigning in your area, ask them some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we'll move on to our candidates that we have here with us to answer questions. Um, I'll introduce them briefly. <clears throat> the candidates with us today running for the Minnesota Legislature are for Minnesota Senate 28, Jeremy Miller, John Pieper. For Minnesota Senate 21, Mike Goggin, Matt Schmidt. For Minnesota House 28A with us this evening we have Gene Pulowski. Not present tonight is Adam Pace. For Minnesota House 21B, we have Elise Dieslin and Steve Draskowski. And for Minnesota Senate 28B, we have Thomas Trias, and unable to attend is Greg Davids. Candidates have allowed me to use their first names throughout the rest of this proceeding, so we would like to begin with opening statements, and our first speaker will be Jeremy. Well, <clears throat> Stephanie, thank you so much, and thank you to the League of Women Voters and all the co-sponsors for uh, hosting this legislative uh, forum tonight. Uh, my name is Jeremy Miller. I've had the honor and privilege of representing uh, Winona, Houston, and Fillmore counties as a member of the Minnesota Senate for the last six years. 
I'm really very proud of what we've been able to accomplish and what I've been able to help accomplish uh, during those last six years. Uh, one of the first uh, proposals I worked on was reforming the problematic uh, Green Acres program to provide uh, property tax relief for our farmers. I've worked very closely with uh, local law enforcement officials to make uh, synthetic drugs like uh, bath salts and plant food uh, illegal here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, together with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, uh, we've made some uh, significant investments in early childhood education, which is extremely important for our youngsters. And we've worked hard to equalize the funding formula for our K-12 uh, school districts, especially those in uh, greater Minnesota. Uh, we've honored our veterans. I worked very hard on the southeastern uh, Minnesota State Veterans Cemetery. And just this year, uh, we passed a proposal to exempt uh, military pensions from the state income tax, a proposal that we've worked on uh, for many, many years. I also think it's very important to uh, provide a safety net and, and provide services for our most vulnerable citizens. And we've done that with our disability community, as well as our elderly and nursing homes. Uh, we made some significant investments uh, in nursing homes. And uh, really, the way we get this stuff done is by working together. Uh, you have to be able to uh, be willing to work across the aisle. Uh, you have to put partisan politics aside. And uh, I'm happy that I've been able to accomplish that and develop those relationships and uh, really take action and get results from uh, the people, uh, for the people here in southeastern Minnesota. And again, thank you for coming and uh, certainly would appreciate your vote on November 8th. John? Again, thanks everybody for coming. My name is John Pieper. I uh, currently reside in Lanesboro, Minnesota. So since I'm new to Winona here, I'll give you a quick recap. Um, my children are seventh generation Norwegian, fifth generation German. Farmers for over a century. Um, my father farmed, my brother is still on the farm. Um, but there was a big switch in the 1930s. My grandma got a college degree, married a man with a sixth grade education. That changed the whole family dynamics. All four of my aunt uncles went to college, two for parochial colleges, two at Winona State here. On my mother's side, her and her two siblings also went to Winona State. So I have two Winona State parents, four aunts and uncles, uh, and my father getting a master's degree here. But why that story is important is because of the value of education to me. And it, and it didn't stop at that generation. There's five of us in our family. Between the five of us, we have five master's degrees. So just, I'm just showing the importance of education to, to my family. Um, I was born in Rochester, uh, graduated from Caledonia High School, attended uh, Gustavus Adolphus College in Mankato State, got a master's degree in computer science from the University of Oregon. And while I was a software engineer, I worked on an MBA at the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. Uh, 22 years ago, my wife and I bought an abandoned, uh, abandoned fire station in Lanesboro, Minnesota, and built a restaurant, and we're still operating that today. Uh, my wife and I, Sarah, have three children. They all attend Lanesboro Public, High School, or Public School. Uh, one's a junior, freshman, and a seventh grader. Um, the other thing that we've continued is the farming thing. My wife and I also own a farm in Houston County. Uh, we've owned that for uh, 27 years now. And that's been a, a big uh, uh, outdoors thing for us. We've planted 125,000 trees. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Mike? Uh, good evening. I'm Mike Goggin. Uh, I'm the endorsed Republican candidate for the Senate District 21. Uh, I've also recently been endorsed by the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Minnesota Farm Bureau, and the Minnesota Citizens for Concerned Life. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody here, League of Women Voters, for inviting me and everybody in attendance here tonight in Winona. Uh, I've been married to my wife. It'll be 26 years at the end of this month. We have two incredibly uh, great sons, David and Dylan. Uh, they've grown up to be fine young men, uh, real respected by their peers and, and uh, adults in the community, which gives me great pride in that. Uh, I did grow up in Red Wing, uh, graduated Red Wing High School. Um, I'm a project manager, a certified project manager and electrical engineer out at the Prairie Island Nuclear Generating Plant. Uh, I've been out there a little over 12 years. Uh, great great works out there with the ability to work across different groups. Uh, 
one thing I see most out there is with our projects is uh, we need more skilled laborers, skilled tradespeople. Uh, what we have out right now is we have a lot of people that are getting old, uh, getting ready to retire, and we don't have uh, younger folks coming into the trades uh, at the volume that we need them to. Uh, so one thing I want to encourage in, as I get into the Senate is to uh, get people uh, interested in the trades and going after that because that's good, solid work. It's always going to be there for people. Um, I've never been a politician. I uh, got into it because I just did not like the direction our state was going. And uh, mom and dad always said, if you don't like something, get involved, make a difference, change it. And so that's what I intend to do. And so on November 8th, I hope everybody here will vote for me. Thank you. Matt? All right. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for hosting this uh, great forum. It's, it's nice to be able to get together and, and discuss the issues of the day today. Um, I'm Matt Schmidt. I'm uh, born and raised in Red Wing, just up the river, uh, the son of a, a school teacher and a football coach. I'm a small business owner, and uh, over the last 10 years, I've worked uh, with a variety of state uh, and local governments, chambers of commerce, and foundations on a variety of issues uh, relevant to my day-to-day -day job here in the legislature now. A lot of uh, lessons I was able to learn to apply to my job as a state senator. I ran in 2012 because I was not happy with the direction of Minnesota. In the course of about 10 years, uh, we had had legislatures and governors not deal with recurring budget challenges in Minnesota, kick the can forward on some tough decisions, and in that span, we had two state government shutdowns, we had recurring budget deficits. A lot of the burden of state government was shifted to our local communities and our schools, and they were falling behind. Property taxes went up. Folks were feeling the pinch. And folks, that wasn't the Minnesota that I grew to love and call home. And so uh, in the time, uh, in 2012, we, we decided to, to throw our head in the ring, knocked on 30,000 doors as a team, put 50,000 miles on the car, and, and marched in about 20 parades. And what we were able to do is talk about what we wanted to change in Minnesota. And we wanted to have a legislature that got work done and worked together, uh, able to balance the budget honestly, invest in education. And I can tell you, folks, we delivered on those promises and many more. In our short time in the legislature, the last three and a half years, we've been able to turn the corner on those recurring budget deficits. Instead of surplus, I'm sorry, instead of deficits, we have surpluses. Just a couple weeks ago, we, we returned Minnesota's bond rating to AAA status, as high as you can get in the country. It makes it more affordable for us to invest in education and infrastructure, those sorts of things with bonding. We've been also uh, able to, uh, to, to get our work done uh, in Minnesota. No budget shutdowns or state government uh, showdowns. It's been able to, uh, we've been able to, to, to charge a vision moving forward for investing in Minnesota, and I'm very proud of the work we've been able to accomplish. Uh, as my priorities in rural competitiveness have taken me to broadband expansion in rural Minnesota, we've been able to accomplish a lot of things for rural areas. And uh, moving forward, I hope to continue on that work and, uh, and look forward to the questions we have here tonight. So thank you. Jean? Yes. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, League of Women Voters. As a past president of the Winona League of Women Voters, I want to emphasize the fact they do take men. <laughs> Not many, but they do. I also learned they elevate us to positions of leadership rather quickly. Uh, and I didn't know I would have been the only man at the state convention that year. So I want to thank the League and AAUW, but I also want to emphasize what we've done this legislative session and what we need to continue to do and what's been left unfinished. I had the privilege of working with Representative Draskowski as one of five members of the House Tax Conference Committee. We passed what I consider to be a historic tax bill. That tax bill did things we talked about for decades. It reformed the AG component of how we pass educational referendums. That is a huge change in Minnesota law, and the impact on education in greater Minnesota would also have been huge if that had been signed. In that bill, we would be the first state to address the burden of student collegiate debt in the nation. I consider this to be as important as what happened on Wall Street, what happened in banking, what happened in the automotive, what happened in real estate. Unfortunately, there was an error in that bill. Secondly, we also passed a bonding bill. That bonding bill had components for, again, our area. The Education Village, Senator Miller and I worked on that. The Port Authority here also had a component. There were a number of things in that bill that had that bill been signed by the governor, we would have seen exactly what we had a couple of weeks ago here with that bridge. That bridge is a demonstration of what infrastructure improvement can do to a community and transform it. Take a look at downtown Winona before the new bridge. Take a look at it now. Then transform education with the Education Village. Transform the Winona port with improvements in the port. That's the importance of making sure we have investments in Minnesota. 
Elise. So I've never ran for office, so I have mine prepared. <laughs> uh, hello, friends and neighbors of Southern Minnesota. I'm Elise Dieselin. I'm happy to be here this evening with the opportunity to talk with all of you in an open forum. I would like to extend my thanks to the League of Women Voters, too, for giving us this forum and opportunity. I decided to get in this race because I felt we needed new leadership to represent us at the Minnesota State House. The values that bring us together as friends and neighbors should be what is uniting us in our common goals in life. I believe in this because I've been a resident of southern Minnesota my whole life. We want stronger education for our children entering this fast-paced technology environment. Having children go from pre-K through 12th grade is a community moment. We need community. Having two teachers as parents, I see how much they care for the lives they are leading to bright and successful futures. This is important work and it takes all of us to see that our children all get the chance to lead successful lives. The next part of a successful economy here in rural Minnesota is the ability to connect to the world outside our farms and towns. It is a tragedy to Minnesota voters that a partisan politics got in the way of funding our transportation needs. We cannot allow gridlock to be the new normal of our legislative bodies. This happens on both sides of the aisle and I am not party to anything that gets in the way of our southern Minnesota residents not having a government that is working for them. Lastly, I want to make sure we continue to work together for all of our health care needs. The system across America that we have now is not working for everyone, and we in Minnesota need to continue to lead not only in medical innovations, but our health care that we all desperately need. Many people in our district travel to Rochester at, to work at one of the greatest health care facilities in the world, and they need to know that their health care needs will be met here in the district as well. I live in Elgin, Minnesota, and I am very glad to be here tonight. Um, it's been interesting, and I am very thankful to be invited, and I hope you vote for me in November. Steve? Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, League, for inviting me as well tonight. Um, uh, it's uh, definitely a, a different time as we look at uh, where we are at economically in Minnesota. We have a government that has continued to move forward. Uh, even through the recession years of 2008 through 2012 and 13, uh, we had government grow very, very, very quickly. Um, and uh, I continue to work to bring government to yield to the people again, and that's been my uh, recurring work and recurring theme and what I have focused on in the legislature. Here in Minnesota, while we are looking at family household median incomes that are struggling, uh, that are at, at many times at levels lower than they were five and six years ago, um, we are seeing government that has grown by 500% after adjusted for inflation and population growth over the last 50 years. Uh, let me repeat that again. After adjusting for inflation and population growth, our government has grown by 500% in 50 years. Um, what I like to bring to, to the table, and, and Representative Pulowski mentioned the tax bill, and it's unfortunate, uh, and he and I worked together with Representative Davids, our chair, who did an outstanding job uh, bringing forward a great tax bill that would provided $551 million of tax relief to the people of Minnesota, including property tax relief for small businesses, for farmers, for students, and for our veterans. And uh, to have, uh, and by the way, um, that bill was passed by 89% of the legislature. All Republicans in the Minnesota House and 51 of 61 Democrats voted for the bill and Governor Dayton vetoed it. We worked together very effectively as a legislature on that piece of, of legislation and the governor chose to use it for partisan politics. We have to move beyond that and work for what's in the interest of the people of Minnesota rather than focusing on those special interests. So uh, thank you for having me, and I would appreciate your vote on November 8th. Thomas. Great. Thank you, Stephanie, and the League of Women Voters for putting this forum together, and thanks for inviting us a bit south of here. I live in rural Spring Grove in Wilmington Township, and I'm the uh, fifth generation to have uh, lived on my family farm we've, since we've immigrated from Norway and kind of never left. And so I had the opportunity recently to, or uh, uh, s several years ago, to move back and uh, contribute to my uh, community and, and, uh, and do what's, what's best for our, uh, the people who gave so much to me. Um, so I serve on the Spring Grove School Board of Education um, and I work for a construction company in Harmony called Minowa Construction. And um, one of the reasons why I'm running is, is because uh, we've had 
uh, several years of, of leadership that has uh, not delivered for a small towns and small farms in rural Minnesota. And uh, that's all the, the district, Houston and Fillmore County has are small towns under 5,000. And I feel like um, when it comes to educational opportunities, when it comes to uh, the burden on our farmers, <coughs> the tax burden on our farmers, uh, when it comes to our roads and bridges, um, if we don't start prioritizing us in rural Minnesota, uh, we're going to be left behind and we're going to continue to see uh, population de decline and school enrollment decline and that's uh, that's why I moved back and that's why I'm I'm running for for the legislature so I hope uh, we conduct a, an interesting uh, informative dialogue and I'm happy to answer your further questions thank you thank you candidates for your opening statements we're now ready for our first question and we're going to start with this question with John what are the top three priorities for the 2017 Minnesota Legislative Session? I think that's a pretty straightforward question, is finishing what they didn't get done in the 2016 session, which would be getting the tax bill fixed so there's not a tobacco tax break, and getting the $100 million gambling fix corrected, getting the bonding bill finished in a, in a nonpartisan way without going around uh, what used to be Minsky were Minnesota State and the Minnesota Department of Transportation, and continuing with education. Um, Gene's right. The next big financial hit we are going to have is with the over a trillion dollars of student debt. Um, when I was lucky enough to go to Winona, or Mankato State, the state paid almost 70 percent of the tuition. They're now paying in, in the 40 percent range, so we're shortchanging our students from preschool to, to the university level. Thank you. Mike? Well, the top three priorities are going to be uh, getting back to the road, roads and bridges, uh, bonding bill uh, that didn't make it through this year in the session. Um, unfortunately, that got uh, axed because it was uh, a late amendment by the uh, Senate Democrats to uh, add the South Coast Light Rail, which took, a, took away our funding for small, to uh, small communities for the roads and bridges. Uh, Minsure needs to be fixed. Everywhere I go in this district, people are just telling me that they can't afford it. They've gone without. Businesses are, uh, small businesses are even saying that next month they may have to shut down. Uh, and lastly, we need to get equitable funding for our, our rural schools. A uh, huge disconnect between the metro schools and the rural schools as far as school funding per pupil. Matt? All right. uh, in, in brief, uh, uh, the three priorities I would have, first of all, we have to continue uh, our recent uh, commitment to fiscal responsibility. It is such an important thing for this legislature to be, uh, to be in the black when it comes to our budget, not be running deficits, but rather have a healthy surplus, being able to, to provide resources for our schools, uh, for our local governments, to help them hold property taxes down and, and contribute to, to rural economic competitiveness. So that continued string of fiscal responsibility with our state budget, first priority. Second, we have to double down on that which makes Minnesota great. That's our competitive advantages in human capital, education, infrastructure. We've got to make sure that we continue our effort to doing what's right for our kids in schools and colleges, making college affordable, uh, helping our school districts get back on their feet after a, a decade or more of neglect, and also making sure that we invest, when times are good, in our roads and bridges, in our critical infrastructure. And that includes broadband internet access throughout all of rural Minnesota. But third and probably most important, health care affordability and choice. Uh, this is a challenge that's facing a lot of Minnesotans, and I hope there's a specific question to this end later on because there's so much to say about health care reform. But in 2017, the state is poised to do a lot in health care reform, and, and I hope that we, uh, we can uh, move forward on that issue. Gene. If there um, is not a special session, and that's still being discussed, then the bonding bill and the tax bill would be the first priority. But I think the next priority is even bigger. We have to reform Minnesota's legislative process. We have had a string of failures over the last six years, and those failures have been because the process itself is broken. In 2015, we couldn't finish special session. In 2016, we couldn't finish, and we can't even agree on a special session. I have on the table out there a presentation that I do based on the work of the Government Operations Committee in 2007 and 2008, when as chair I had eight hearings on the legislative process of the House itself. And those recommendations, and we did pass two to the rules, are what we need to do in order to ensure we finish on time, 
we do the work of the people of Minnesota, and we don't pass bonding bills that have 30 major errors, 28 minor errors, and then one error that puts it $800 million off. Elise. My top three priorities would be education, healthcare, and infrastructure, as many people have mentioned. I think pre-K funding is going to be really important. There is a $25 million cap, $25 million cap, and schools, Winona Public School and Wabasha Kellogg both applied for and were not granted funding for pre-K. So all of their pre-K children don't have the same access as other schools that got the funding. Healthcare again, we need to revisit Minsure and make tweaks to it. Our uninsured rate in Minnesota is down to 4.3%, which is great, but I think we can make it lower. And similar with infrastructure, we need to get a bonding bill in that works for everyone and that everyone that can agree on and not have it be partisan politics. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. Um, first of all, I think the top priority is that we need to have a tax bill, similar to one that we had, and hopefully even a larger tax relief package for the hardworking people in Minnesota that pay the bills that make this huge government that we have run. Uh, so that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, we need a transportation funding bill that focuses on what has been sold to us over time and that is roads and bridges and the needs to fix roads and bridges rather than a situation where um, the governor and others come forward with a bait and switch tactic in the end and bring light rail transit forward and throw our roads and bridges uh, into the ditch. Uh, and then lastly, we need to make sure we don't have tax increases. Uh, thank goodness that Republicans controlled the Minnesota House this last year, or we would have had a repeat, and we will have a repeat next biennium if indeed we have full throttle Democrat control again. There will be huge tax increases similar to the $2.1 billion tax increase that was passed in 2013 and 14. Uh, don't get me wrong, the Democrats will not pass tax relief. It will be a huge tax increase. Thomas. Uh, we're going to pass a bonding bill in the first 30 days, and I think uh, with interest rates as low as they are, it's a smart thing to do. In Spring Grove on, on the school board, we just uh, bonded $4 million, and one of the reasons why we could because of interest rates and, and to, uh, to think that uh, it has to be um, under a billion or some magic number I don't think is, is appropriate. We need to pass a bonding bill to fuck, fix the, the Lanesboro Dam in Lanesboro, which is desperately in need of repair, uh, so there's no excuses for that. Uh, pass that tax bill. Uh, I agree with probably 90, 95 percent of the tax bill, but the process, uh, like Representative Pulowski mentioned, is is uh, is horrible, and we got to fix the process. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to see maybe a, a 50 percent actually on uh, ag credit on school bonds instead of a 40 percent. I think um, that'll really help our farmers. And we need to pass the long-term transportation bill that funds our roads and bridges. And uh, we can't. Um, hold up uh, pieces of projects in the Twin Cities uh, just because we don't like them and then uh, not get our roads and bridges. We need to, to work together as a state and to fix our transportation system. Thank you. Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, first and foremost, we need to address the soaring cost of health care. This is, Minsure has been an absolute disaster. Uh, we need to more than tweak it, we need to fix it, and in order for us to do this, we're going to have to work together with our federal folks because most of uh, Minsure and the whole debacle is as a result of uh, the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare. So it's time for Republicans and Democrats to truly work together on health care reform so we can get those costs and access in line. Number two, we need to continue to make investments in education, both pre-K-12 and higher education. And number three, we need a long-term, comprehensive, bipartisan transportation package with a strong focus on roads and bridges. Thank you. Moving on to our second question. Um, we're going to be starting with Mike for this one. I'm going to read it twice. It is a little bit lengthy. So, To lessen transportation congestion on our highways and in our airports, which of the following do you feel would be the most cost-effective option and why? A. Build more highway expansion lanes. B. New metro light rail and elevated high-speed rail. C. More park and ride megabusing. Or D. More time, more on-time frequent passenger rail service on existing freight rail infrastructure. Again, to lessen transportation congestion on our highways and in our airports, which of the following do you feel would be most cost-effective and why? 
build more light, more highway expansion lanes, new metro light rail and elevated high speed rail, more park and ride megabussing, or more on time frequent passenger rail service on existing freight rail infrastructure. Well, what I see on that one is actually a combination of one and three. Um, it gives us some much more flexibility if we if we expand our current uh, roads and bridges uh, lanes, but we also go into like a bus rapid transit system where we can add more buses as we need to or decrease the buses. We can rotate the lanes around. Much cheaper to build a, a highway, which in the metro area runs about eight to ten million dollars per mile for a four-lane highway. Uh, Light rail, on the other hand, is costing about $124 million a mile. Uh, so when we look at the small uh, length of track that that does, it's not going to do a whole lot to take cars off the road. But I would be in favor of the bus rapid transit system where we build actual bus lanes that would uh, uh, take care of that for us. And then we have the flexibility in the future. Matt. Yeah. As a rural legislator, I'm going to say first and foremost that our priorities are roads and bridges, period. And I think that's important for us to recognize in rural Minnesota. But as we look at the state as a whole, I think the answer to your question is probably all of the above. We need to have a flexible multimodal transportation system around the state, or especially uh, options for those uh, congested areas uh, such as the uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan area. And so I think that you have to be willing to, to put together a comprehensive transportation funding package that's bipartisan in, in nature with, uh, with support in the House and the Senate, Democrats and Republicans, that recognizes the different priorities in rural Minnesota versus metropolitan Minnesota. And so I think that we have to have dedicated funding uh, for our rural roads and bridges, but we also have to give uh, the metropolitan uh, residents and their business community that demands it the options for investing in the kind of infrastructure that they want in the 21st century that allows for competitive statewide and, and metropolitan and markets uh, to attract the best and the brightest workforce and to, to do what we can to, to relieve congestion on our roads. And so I think there's a smart fix here. It's a balanced approach that we need. And, and as a member of the, the Transportation Conference Committee, we got very close this year, and we hope to continue our work in, in the months ahead. Gene. Yes, in greater Minnesota, we have to focus on repairing current infrastructure. We have in this community an example of what happens when you close a major transportation artery. When that bridge closed, we had businesses in downtown Winona that the day after the bridge closed lost 70% of business. 70% of business. And we've seen what's happened when a new bridge is built that offers opportunity in a community that really hadn't done much with its riverfront. So instead of focusing on questions that deal with the metro, I want to continue to focus on Greater Minnesota. And in Greater Minnesota, repair and maintenance of our current infrastructure, whether it's bridges, whether it's roads, whether it's the county, or whether it's the city. That has to be our top priority as a Greater Minnesota legislator. Elise. I agree with what Jean said as far as general repairs. Um, and I understood the question as what would we do in our district specific. And I think our district would benefit from park and ride megabus systems. We already have a system like that set up in Elgin, where I live, with mail, but it's usually limited to mail employees, and there are very limited hours that someone can use the megabus. And so if we could open that up to general public and open the times to earlier in the day and later in the evening, I think that would be beneficial to everyone involved. Steve. We need to focus on, on the uh, roads and bridges that uh, have been discussed by Minnesotans, rather than uh, on the um, ideas that are brought forward and bait and switched on the legislature and the people of Minnesota by the special interest group of the Transportation Alliance, which brings together uh, all kinds of government interests along with uh, big unions and big business who all have huge interests um, in what happens. And so you, what you saw was their impact at the end, end of session uh, along with the, the Senate to try to uh, get rid of our roads and bridges and instead place in their light rail transit, which the people of our area subsidize at a rate of 70% of every ride after the train is built. <coughs> Now that is not the direction that I'm hearing from the people of our district. What I'm hearing is take care of our roads, take care of our bridges, and let's move on and let's give us some tax relief. Thomas? Yeah. We actually don't have a lot of congestion in Houston and Fillmore County, but, uh, but I recognize the, the question. And uh, we got to fix what we have. We have at least $600 million per year, at least $600 million just in additional maintenance costs, and that's going to be uh, going into... Um, that's a deficit over the next 10, 
20 years. So just in uh, Fillmore County, we have about 35 bridges that are structurally deficient, uh, another 25 or so in Houston County. Um, if we're not fixing that issue, uh, then I don't know how we can look towards other, other things. So uh, uh, roads and bridges are, are a must. But uh, we also have a, a fair number of folks who commute to Rochester and La Crosse and making sure opportunities are available for those people, too, to commute uh, who don't want to drive and maybe want to do work on the way. So we've got to focus on uh, rural transit as well and, and to help, um, help our, our commuter citizens. Jeremy. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, the legislature had bipartisan agreement in both the House and the Senate on a bonding bill that included eight, over $800 million of transportation funding. Um, I'm not an expert on metro transit, but I do know that light rail costs a lot of money, and more importantly, it costs a lot of money to subsidize the operations of uh, light rail that the folks here in southeastern Minnesota may not use, but they still have to pay for and I'm not sure that's the right funding model for uh, light rail. So again, as I mentioned earlier, roads and bridges is what we need to focus on, and that includes potholes. Uh, that's what I'm hearing from the folks here in southeastern Minnesota, is let's focus on the infrastructure we have, and that includes roads, bridges, and uh, fixing those potholes. John. I think I'm going to agree with almost everybody here. It's none of the above. Um, we don't need to build new things. We need to fix what we have. Uh, I gave you a couple examples in the district. There's a bridge out. It's been out for five years at the old barn resort. There's one way in. Safety hazard, if there was a fire there, you couldn't get rescue equipment there. There's no funding for that bridge. Um, bring up another example, Highway 52. The blacktop is peeled off of it. We actually have tourists not going to Harmony, Minnesota, because they don't want to drive on that road. So we're talking an eight mile segment of road that's basically undrivable on a major state highway. So we don't need to build new transportation systems. We need to fix what we have now. For our next question, we're going to start with Matt. Now, just remember, you have one minute to respond to this question. How would you recommend reforming the legislative process to avoid the gridlock that we have seen in recent years? Right. One it's minute. A, it's a great question, and I have to tell you, um, I look forward to Representative Plowski's uh, remarks because he's done a lot of work in this regard. But what we've seen is we've seen way too much uh, posturing, way too much delay. Uh, this last year, uh, the state senate put out its bonding bill a month before adjournment. And so we were one month into session, we put out our bonding bill for the state of Minnesota to, to review, uh, to vet it, uh, to look at what works, what doesn't. And, uh, and that was the process that we're supposed to follow. The committee process, put your ideas out there and let folks digest them, uh, vet, the pro vet the product, and give feedback. And unfortunately with the, the Minnesota House there, we saw a bonding bill come out in the last couple of days of the session. And, and that contributed to the gridlock that we saw over the bonding uh, issue, uh, for one. And so I think if we're able to, to, to put in line a dead Deadline that all big omnibus bills must meet uh, well in advance of the constitutionally mandated adjournment date, as Representative Pulowski has uh, suggested. I think it goes a long ways in allowing legislators to know what's in the big bills, allows the public to see what's in those bills, and allows for the kind of uh, review and vetting that you need leading up to the end of session. And I think those changes by themselves could go a long ways. Thank you. Gene. I'm going to refer again to what we did on the Government Operations Committee in 2007 and 2008 with eight hearings open to the entire House that produced a comprehensive report which is on the table as you leave. So the first thing we need to do, in 2015 and 2016, 4,000 plus bills were introduced in the Minnesota House by 134 members on a session that can only meet 120 days. We had members introduce as many as 102, and for your information, I introduced four. So limit the number of bills. Strict deadlines for both fiscal and policy committees. No committee, no session goes past midnight because we all know nothing good happens past midnight. So midnight, committees end, floor sessions end, and everybody goes home so everybody knows what had happened. And when I say strict fiscal deadlines, we need to set fiscal targets well in advance of the end of session so our committees can actually study the fiscal targets and know the impact on education, transportation, health care. Elise. Thank you. I think it all goes down to transparency. I think there should be at least 24 hours to be able to review new bills. It's ridiculous to get one 
like you said, after midnight, or just here's a brand new bill that's hundreds of pages long and you can't possibly get through it. How can you vote on something if you're uninformed? And I think that we need to know your timeline. Where else can you work and not get your deadline done and not get something done on time? It's ridiculous. We have to work together. This cannot happen. We, this gridlock is ridiculous. And anyone that can see it and watches it from the outside knows that it's insane. It's insanity to do the same thing over and over and expect different results. It's impossible. Steve. Yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of good things have been said. Uh, first of all, we, we need to have, uh, we need to have our finance bills passed uh, before we entertain policy bills. And I, I think that would be a great change to the rules. It's uh, one that has been talked about by both parties in the House. Um, and um, uh, I'll tell you what, this, this um, waiting till the end has been a trend that has accumulated and, and presented itself more and more since I've been a member of the House. And it's, I think it's troubling to all of us. Um, and we do need to have more time to review bills. And again, uh, we've had major bills, including tax bills and bonding bills, was mentioned earlier. Uh, the tax bill that was passed in 13 and 14 that produced the $90 million Senate office building uh, was passed to us with minutes for us to review it on the floor. Uh, we can't be doing that. Uh, and I think we need to look at the policy that, or the practice that has come forward where the governor, the Speaker of the House, and the Senate Majority Leader get together in order to form policy in and out of special session and then find its membership on the way down. Our, Thank you. Our democracy Your time's up on that. that way. Thank you. Thomas? Yeah, well, there's definitely a lot of political posture happening mm -hmm. at the legislature from, from members who have been in there uh, for a very long time. You'd think after a while you would learn uh, to get your job done on time if you're, say, in a leadership position. Um, say a, maybe a tax chair or something like that. Um, so, uh, so no, I'm really disappointed. A lot of uh, people I talked to at the doors, their number one complaint is uh, legislatures not doing their job, and and that's pretty obvious. So, uh, Representative Pulaski has some really good ideas. We need uh, stricter deadlines to to provide opportunities for folks to members to read uh, what they are voting on. I think that's kind of a, a logical thing to do. Um, you need to give members of the press time to look at the legislation and you need to give constituents time to look at the legislation uh, and anything less than that is is not acceptable in in a democracy um, and the bill uh, introducing a limiting number of bills you can introduce I think that's a great idea my uh, representative Davids who can't be here unfortunately introduced over 80 bills that I think that's a lot <laughs> Jeremy thank you Stephanie for the question this question addresses my biggest frustration in the legislature which is why I co-founded I co-chair the bipartisan Purple Caucus in the Senate. We bring together Republicans and Democrats. We put party politics aside, and we work together on what's best for the people in the state of Minnesota. The extreme partisanship has gone too far, and it absolutely needs to stop. We rolled out a proposal this year that would have final bills and conference committee reports must be introduced and on our desks one week prior to the end of the session. So us as legislators can actually read and understand the bills. Uh, the public can be involved in that. We need more transparency in the legislative process. The Purple Caucus is working on this, and we're going to continue to work on this because that, folks, is how we work together and get things done and do good things for the people in the state of Minnesota. John. Well, I'm just going to go back to some life experience. I can remember being in college, and the first thing you get on the first day of school is a syllabus. It puts out specifically what day tests are going to be, what your reading requirements are, and a professor would never drop 500 pages of reading you on the day before the final test. So I agree with Gene. If we had a schedule, a common sense schedule, it would, it would stop a lot of this problem. Uh, but I think there's also a bigger problem. It, it is partisanship. And actually take this very serious. And I've got a pledge on all my, all my stuff that I send out. That I, I pledge to represent the people of southeastern Minnesota, not a political party. And I take that seriously. Um, a lot of Purple Party members vote straight Republican. I vow not to do that. I will look at the bills. I will work with everybody. Because not just Republicans have good ideas. Not just Democrats have good ideas. Together, we'll even have better ideas. Thank you. Mike? I agree with what uh, Jeremy and John have said here, mostly with the, and Gene, because uh, we do need common sense. There's a project manager, 
first thing I have to do when I, when, I, when I put a project together is I build a business case and I build a schedule. And we have to stick to that schedule in order to meet the timeline so we don't go over budget, we don't have scope change, what have you. Um, back on May 4th, the Democrats did have a bonding tra transportation bill that they passed, but it did not include anything for Southwest Light Rail. Unfortunately, at the end of the session, uh, when, when the uh, uh, bonding bill came through, they put on the Southwest Light Rail. Why it was there, I have no idea. That doesn't make any sense. But we need to stay true to our word. And we need to make sure that what we're doing is in the best interest of the people of our district in southeastern Minnesota. Uh, they're the people that put us in that seat, not the caucus, not the parties. The people put us there. And we need to do what the people want us to do. Thank you. For our next question, we're going to start with Jean. Do you support the constitutional amendment for setting wages for the legislature, and why or why not? No, I did not. I voted against it. I thought that it was improper for us to set up a system where we would be dealing with our wages. In particular, we did that in 2013 and 2014. So I voted no, and uh, I, I would hope that what would happen on the ballot uh, when uh, people take a look at that constitutional amendment, they think long and hard on the ramifications. We're a part-time legislature. I hope we continue to remain a part-time legislature. Elise? I do not think that legislature, legislators should set their wage. I think it's a conflict of interest, and I think it should go to a third party to decide. Steve? Um, I uh, voted against the amendment proposal on the floor and stand by it. Uh, we. Um, all, the Constitution currently says, legislature, you prove to us, the people of Minnesota, if you need a salary increase, you put forward the salary increase and pass it for the next legislature. And I'll tell you what, it's a very difficult thing to do. And as a matter of fact, uh, these, these uh, committees which uh, form out opinions about what our salary should be have come forward each of the last several years with $10,000 salary increases and I voted against it each and every time but this legislature in 2000, not this legislature, the previous legislature in 13 and 14 put this on the ballot and it did so knowing that it was going to be a, about a $10,000 salary increase. And it was interesting how they worded this and said, we're going to take the power away from the legislature and give it to a citizens group. Well, that citizens group is prepared to give a $10,000 raise to the state legislature. Thomas? I do support the Constitution Amendment. I think it should, be, it should not be up to the legislature to set their own wages. I don't know of any job that, that you get to just set your own wages. I don't think that exists, if I recall. So um, one of the reasons why a lot of good legislators retire uh, is because they, if they have a family, uh, it is hard to, to deal with uh, the, the, the job on, on the, the, the pay, and the pay from the 1990s. So uh, uh, we need to attract good people to run for the legislature, not just um, lawyers or, or people who have given, been given uh, a nice inheritance and they can just do whatever uh, they want. Uh, we need to attract working people and, and uh, when the uh, base salary is $31,000 um, uh, that might be a little harder to do in the future. So um, I would support the amendment. Jeremy. Uh, Stephanie, thanks for the question. Uh, I voted no uh, on the constitutional amendment on the Senate floor and uh, I do not support it. Uh, Minnesota is a part-time citizens legislature. Uh, it is not you don't run uh, to make money. You run to help make a difference and uh, try to do good things for uh, the people that uh, that we represent. At least that's why I do it. So um, I do not support uh, the constitutional amendment. John, um, I'm going to be actually. I'm not going to. going to be undecided at this moment. I'm not into the legislature, and I can, I'm not doing this for pay. But I have a major concern with pay. Uh, we have a lease over here that works a nine to five job. I'm not sure what happened to her if she got elected, if you could afford to live on that. On this side of the table, we have at least three business owners that I know, and a, I don't know, and a retired gentleman. Uh, it makes it a little <laughs> semi. <e> semi retired. <laughs> it makes it a little bit easier when, uh, mine's a little easier to have a seasonal business, but I, I can put it on some of my employees when I'm gone. But if you're working a nine to five and trying to make a go at it in the world, 
Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. I think there has to be some fairness in, in salaries to get a broader scope of candidates. Mike. I would not be in favor of this constitutional amendment. I don't think there should be any special committees to do uh, to come up with that. I think that's ripe for, for uh, people to load up the committee with their cronies, and uh, I don't think that would be right. If anything, I would have it go out every two years on, on a ballot item that uh, we, the voters, would vote on that. Um, as we know, the Senate Democrats voted themselves a 35% pay increase. However, that didn't get seen through the, Senate, uh, through the House, so that didn't get passed through. I can tell you as an IBEW union member in the last 12 years, my wages have not gone up 35% on cost of living adjustments. Um, we are part-time citizen legislators. It's personal sacrifice. It's a choice we make. And we need to be a public servant. And we need to do public service. We don't need this, this bill to, to pay us that kind of money or whatever kind of money it would be. It's citizen legislators working for the best interests of the uh, Senate district. Matt. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, you know, first of all, I ran for the state senate as an act of public service. I believed I had something to contribute and I wanted to contribute. I do the job gladly, regardless of the pay. Uh, and, and when you look at how many hours you put into this job, <laughs> you, you don't want to do the math. Uh, but the point is, I don't think the legislature should be voting on compensation issues. It's a conflict of interest. I think uh, we should, we should uh, move forward with this constitutional amendment and I would support it. Thank you. Moving on to our next question. For this one, we'll start with Elise. Health insurance premiums are expected to rise significantly in the state of Minnesota. What should our Minnesota legislature consider addressing regarding this issue? Please comment on Minsure, our Minnesota Insurance Exchange, the private insurance provider fallout, and how to keep the cost of prescription drugs down. We have five minutes for this one. <laughs> Once again, you only have one minute. <laughs> So um, before I work where I work now, I didn't have health insurance provided for me. And so I think Minsure is a very important thing because in April I turned 26 and I didn't know what I was going to be doing for health insurance. And so I'm not entirely sure how we can lower premiums, but that's definitely a thing we need to lower. And I would like to respond to working my 9 to 5 job. My employer is prepared to work with me getting one step closer to women having it all. Steve. You know, this was, uh, Mincher was passed by the, t another bad item passed by the 2013 All-Democrat Control Legislature and Governor uh, collection that we had here in the state of Minnesota. And as we've seen, um, health insurance um, premiums in Minnesota through Mincher and outside of it have increased uh, significantly double digits, huge double digits in each of the last three years. It's projected to be in the area of 60%. Uh, this coming year. Uh, we'll hear the final numbers soon. Uh, but this is a, an abject failure that has sucked $400 million of taxpayer money out of the pockets of the hardworking taxpayers of Minnesota, and it still doesn't work. And when we have legislators in, in St. Paul that continue to protect this thing and then talk around the edges, I think Minnesotans should be uh, ashamed of what we have going on here. Uh, we have attempted to repeal and get rid of this thing in the Minnesota House the last year. Uh, this thing needs to be killed and buried. Thomas? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, uh, you know, we can kill Mincher, repeal Obamacare, but it doesn't address the general cost of health, health care and health insurance in this country and in the state. And here in southeastern Minnesota, we have it um, a harder. We, our premiums are actually higher, I think, than any other region in the state. I'd like to get rid of the lines that, that determine the regions because we're in the Mayo network, but we're still a little distance away from Mayo, so they think that our premium should be higher, and I think that should go away. Um, we need more transparency in the prescription drug uh, costs, and, and so people know what they're paying for, and uh, more transparency in, in what procedures and, and, and things are, are costing, and so, uh, so you uh, take more of your health care into your own hands and, and uh, provide more incentive to, um, to folks who uh, live a healthy life and, and uh, to help reduce the general cost of, of care. So we, there's a lot we can do, but Thank with you. only a minute. Jeremy. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, it would be easy for me to sit here and say I voted against Minsure and point the finger at somebody else. 
but that doesn't address the problem. That doesn't address the problem of soaring health care costs and, and dwindling access to health care and health insurance coverage. Most of the solutions lie with our federal government. Uh, they do. Uh, Minnesota, actually, there are very few things that we can do here because of the Affordable Care Act. First of all, what we need is that we need our federal officials to work together. They need to take a look at the Affordable Care Act. Let's keep what's working and let's scrap or repeal or uh, revise what's not working. That would be the, the biggest solution, and that's at the federal government. What we can do at the state level is uh, we can apply for some federal waivers. Again, this relies on the federal government uh, to grant those waivers. But if they were uh, able to grant those waivers to the state of Minnesota, we could do some things to uh, address cost and accessibility. Uh, one of the other things we can do at the state level is uh, provide some tax credits for those folks who um, are paying really high costs for uh, health coverage. John? <coughs> Yeah, MinSure is not going away, and I can tell you, as a, as a private small business owner, without MinSure, I'd either have to be unemployed or look for a different state. Um, I can just tell you a personal experience. In 2014, before MinSure came in, between my HSA and my monthly premiums, it was going to be $30,000 a year. I don't know very many people, especially small business owners, that can pay out three-quarters of their income for health insurance. So MinSure, MinSure helped me. Uh, it's also a great safety net for our local farmers, especially with this era of $2.50 corn. A lot of these farmers are, are going in the black, uh, or in the red, sorry, in the red. And with that lower income, they're eligible for a lot of the benefits through Minsure. So before we say we're going to get rid of a program that's a safety net for a lot of farmers and small businessmen, uh, we have to realize what kind of economic driver is. Without Minsure, I wouldn't have a small business. Mike. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Thomas said it, said it right too. With the prescription drugs, we do need to have transparency in the cost of those. Um, also, when it comes to the cost of health care, uh, when you go to have a procedure done or go see the doctor and you try to look it up on your insurance uh, website, you can't figure out what it is, what it's going to cost. You have no idea. Plus, then you end up with the delta that usually gets charged to you. Uh, the other thing we need to do is we need to look for a waiver of some kind in order to make Minnesota one region because right now with Rochester Mayo being our sole provider pretty much in southeastern Minnesota, that's kind of like single-payer health care, and we have nobody to choose from but them, and that's what the Affordable Care Act has forced these hospitals and clinics to do is to uh, basically build their own little districts. And uh, we do need help from the federal government, but the other thing I would like to see is private exchanges for like the farmer co-ops, and that's so that people uh, can, can build a co-op of some kind go on and get group rates on, on the exchange. All right. Matt? This is an important question. It's probably the most important question that we, we addressed tonight, and uh, we could spend a whole uh, evening talking about it. Uh, on, on the good side here, I think that this is going to be the focus of the 2017 legislature. Uh, I'll tell you, I've, I've spent the last few years preparing for this. Uh, we had a, a state-level health care uh, finance task force uh, that I followed very closely. Also, a, a series of, of summits in our, our Senate district talking about local concerns. So I think there's going to be a lot of action in this area in 2017. I've already introduced a, a suite of bills to start the conversation. First, we have to look at the fact that this is a federal uh, health policy. Uh, we can't do a whole lot in the state of Minnesota without working with our federal partners. So seeking waivers, as Senator Miller mentioned, is really important. First waiver, redraw the uh, regional uh, and geographic rating area lines just so that uh, we see some parity from one region of the state to the next. Second, I think that we have to expand options uh, and affordable options on, uh, on the, the uh, exchange for folks in the individual and small group markets who are falling through the cracks. That's something that we can do through Minsure. Uh, and also tax credits, uh, another bill that I introduced to help folks with monthly health care premiums. Lots to talk about here, folks. Thank I you. hope we come back Time's to the health care issue. Gene. Yes. The lesson from uh, Minsure is uh, unfortunately a simple one, but a bad one. No state has the resources, including Minnesota, or the expertise to address health care costs. We simply don't. This is an issue that is so big, it has to be addressed by the federal government. And the Affordable Care Act is flawed. It has to be fixed by the federal government, as we've heard from this panel. So Minnesota, despite its best efforts with Minsure, hasn't fixed something that only the federal government can fix. All right, thank you. Moving on to our next question, and for this question we will start with Steve. 
What is your stand on regulation for handguns and multi-clip automatic weapons in Minnesota? Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, I'm a very strong supporter of the Second Amendment. Uh, we have uh, people who are continuing to try to nitpick around the edge and come up with additional prohibitions to tell people what they can't do in order to further degrade our Second Amendment rights. Uh, the Second Amendment says uh, the right shall not be infringed, period. As a matter of fact, uh, we already in law have a lot of infringements in our Second Amendment rights. So I'm not in favor of a, any additional degradation. As a matter of fact, uh, I have introduced legislation in the past and will continue to uh, being a 100% um, uh, grade with the NRA and a, a, always a, an A or an A plus with them. Uh, somebody who wants to see us regain some of those constitutional rights that have already been taken to, from us by the legislature. I'd like to see us move to constitutional carry uh, like many other states are moving towards uh, because a, um, a citizenry that can protect itself is the freest and safest citizenry we've seen across the globe. Thomas. Yeah, well, being that we're so uh, close to Iowa and Wisconsin and we can cross borders freely, I don't think a uh, particular uh, ban or in a, a limitation on a particular uh, firearm or ammunition is going to be helpful. And so, again, uh, to, I know gun safety is a, an issue in, in some larger cities and places, um, and certainly uh, that needs to be taken care of. But as far as uh, us here in southeastern Minnesota, you know, growing up in a very uh, gun heavy culture and, and uh, getting my firearm safety certificate, uh, that's kind of what you do. Um, and uh, uh, in the school board, we just uh, started our trap team, and I think uh, teaching kids how to how to handle a firearm and respect it, I think, is the best uh, best route to go on that issue. Jeremy, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I'm a very strong supporter of our Second Amendment right, and I do not support uh, any additional regulations uh, that were mentioned in the question. Thank you, John. Yeah, and specifically with handguns and multi-clips, yeah, they are protected under the Second Amendment, so I don't see the Minnesota legislature missing with that. Mm -hmm. um, I do like Thomas's idea is, again, being a small-town kid, um, we took gun safety. Actually, I'd like to see that requirement maybe of, of students, and not, not, for, not for being gun owners in the future, but uh, I've, I've had mo both of my uh, teenage girls take gun safety. Because if they're in a home babysitting and they find a loaded handgun or a loaded rifle, a loaded shotgun, they need to know how to make that gun safe. They don't need how to shoot it. It's up to them, their decision. And it's been a split in our household. I have one daughter that's on a trap team and goes deer hunting with me. But they've made that decision independently. But I would like to see students educated on how to safely handle these weapons. Mike? Uh, I support the Second Amendment as it is. I don't see any reason to take anything up in the legislature on handguns and large magazines. Criminals are always going to get the guns one way or another because that's what they do. Uh, they find ways to do that. And law-abiding citizens, it should not matter what uh, law-abiding citizens carry as far as handguns and, and size of magazines or clips. Uh, but I do agree with John and Thomas about the hunter safety. I took that when I was younger. I, I went through it with my kids, to, even though I don't have a gun at home, but I, I did go through it with my kids. So. Matt. I think, you, I think you hear everybody saying that they, uh, they support the, the Second Amendment, and I certainly do as well. And, uh, you know, I, I look at uh, this issue as the, the, the chair of the Senate Game and Fish Subcommittee is one in which we want to promote hunting, fishing, trapping opportunities around Minnesota. And so I'm very enthusiastic about our, our rich traditions in, in, in these areas. You know, on, on the issue of gun violence, I think that we have a great opportunity for looking at an area where we can focus on, on what we have in common and, and consensus, and that's focusing on mental health. And I think it's an issue that's talked a lot about in Minnesota, but we haven't done nearly enough on this issue. And, and so I think that we need to talk about how we can improve mental health uh, offerings, and it's going to take some resources, and it's going to take an, a consistent commitment to doing something about the mental health crisis that's plaguing much of our state. And so that's where I think this conversation sh sh should go. There's a great opportunity for us to make some meaningful change in this area. Gene? Yes. Um, I think Minnesota has uh, significant regulation of both handguns and uh, other types of uh, hunting and uh, uh, rifles. So I would see no further changes needed in Minnesota's regulation of guns. Elise? My father taught firearm safety for many years at my school when I was growing up and I am also certified, although I am not personally a hunter, I have hunters in my family. And I think gun safety is the biggest thing, again, education, like basically everyone has said here. 
at the House poll at the State Fair, 86% of people that were polled were for background checks for gun owners, and I think that implementation before having purchased a gun is very important, especially, as Matt said, with our rich tradition of hunting and fishing in Minnesota. Thank you. This is going to be our last question before we get into closing statements, and we'll start with Thomas. What might the legislature do to fund the cost of education while still increasing our success rate from pre-K through higher education? Yeah, certainly uh, we need to continue to invest in, in pre-K. Uh, that's very important. We know that <clears throat> learning starts very, very early, and uh, the sooner we um, uh, teach our kids uh, the necessary skills to, uh, to be successful, the better. So uh, I'm in favor of universal pre-K. Um, as far as the K-12 education system, uh, we need to focus, like I said in the opening statement, more on our, our smaller school districts that are really struggling right now. Um, our facilities uh, have pretty much fallen by the wayside in a lot of our districts, and, and uh, there's just no money, and the uh, uh, kids are uh, graduating and not moving back home to their communities, and, and, and I uh, have started a little bit of a trend, and I'm hoping to to continue that and be an example for that. But uh, certainly we got to equalize the funding formulas and, and so our, our rural small schools can have just as good as opportunity as, as those in the metro and the rich districts. Jeremy. Thank you, Stephanie. I addressed some of this question in my opening statements. We need to continue to make uh, investments in both pre-K-12 education and higher education. Uh, to me, it's a pre-K higher education system and we need to continue to fund education that way. Uh, the legislature has made significant investments uh, in pre-K education as well as uh, made some strides forward to uh, smaller schools, increasing the funding for uh, smaller schools in greater Minnesota. We do absolutely need to equalize that funding formula. This is something that I've uh, been working on since I've been in the Senate. And as something that Thomas mentioned, the legislature has also made uh, good progress on uh, making investments uh, in greater Minnesota schools and their facilities. Uh, allowing them access to uh, some funds so they can keep up those facilities. So we need to continue to make uh, investments in, in pre-K uh, 12 education as well as higher education. Uh, in higher education, we've been able to uh, freeze tuition and in some cases even lower tuition. And I think that is absolutely incredibly important for our college students as well. John. Again, being in southeastern Minnesota, the first thing we have to fight for is fairness. Again, I know Lanesboro very well since I'm from there. We spend over $13,000 per student. We make that choice as a community. We, pay, we started all day kindergarten before it was paid by the state. We paid for that locally. We have a, we have a, a, a preschool program paid by the school district. We have the first in day, uh, daycare in the state of Minnesota in the school, subsidized by the school. So where does that fall? It falls on the taxpayers. And that's where I have some of this problem with, with the equality of funding. I, I mean, when Minneapolis is getting more money than our, and we want to have a quality education for our children, we have to go to the voters and ask them for more money, which, again, I don't think is a fair thing to do. So equality and fairness will be a very important thing next year. Mike. <clears throat> Oh, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in education. I went back to school at 38 years old to get my electrical engineering degree. I have a son that's right now going for his doctorate in uh, chemical engineering. Um, we need, and, and what happened in Red Wing, uh, you know, we just passed this spring a $22 million referendum to update and upgrade our school system, our schools, our buildings, boilers, what have you. We need to make sure that we maintain our facilities in a safe environment for the kids to, have, to learn in. Uh, so I'm a huge proponent of, of education and making sure that we have that. Um, one thing to look at, my sons, when they were younger, we had them in a home daycare for a while that did somewhat uh, some uh, preschool. But then we went to a semi-public preschool, which I think we need to look at doing that. Uh, not only have it as a public school offering, but as a semi-private public uh, uh, offering as well. And, and offer tax credits for, for people to do that, to get their kids into the system. Thank you. Right. Matt. Very important question, and I'll try to be brief. Um, you know, I talked a lot about this when I was running in 2012, and approximately 40 years ago, we had the, the Minnesota miracle in Minnesota, where at a time where we saw great inequalities around the state in property tax wealth and education funding that was available from one district to the next, there was a 
an incredible bipartisan effort with Governor Wendy Anderson, who recently passed away, to reform the way we raise uh, funding for our schools, a larger state role, to take pressure off of local property taxpayers, and trying to level the playing field around the state. And I have to tell you, I think that that's the kind of thinking that we need to renew in St. Paul, because a lot of our rural districts don't have uh, level footing with some of our wealthier school districts in the metropolitan area. And so you look at the last couple of years here at the State Senate, we, we, we promised in 2012 to pay back a billion dollar school funding shift, and we were able to do that as one of our promises in 2013. On top of that, we've invested another billion dollars in education around the state. Only 60% of those new funds go to the funding formula. The other 40% go to new ways of funding education that in some cases disproportionately help our rural districts. Facility funding is one, also education partnerships at the community level is another. Gene. Um, as I've already said, the House tax bill had a component that would have greatly helped greater Minnesota schools address the disparity in passing referendums with the agricultural community. Had that tax bill been signed into law, I think we would go a long way in greater Minnesota to levying the playing field to making sure we had facilities or the capacity to pass facilities that would be equal to the metropolitan areas that seem to pass them with ease. Secondly, I think Winona's Education Village will go a long way to preparing teachers not just for the 21st century, but preparing teachers who can teach in private schools, public schools, charter schools, home schools, in a way we have never seen before. Winona State was the first teacher preparation college west of the Mississippi. And I think now in the 21st century, it will be the first teacher preparation college that will address what we desperately need, teachers who can teach anywhere and teach the best. Elise. There's three things here. I, as I mentioned earlier, funding for pre-K. Wabasha Kellogg and Winona Public Schools applied for funding and they were one of some of the many schools that were not granted that. And Wabasha Kellogg alone, there, were, there would be many students that just can't get pre-K education and that's the school that my mom works at, so I have an investment in that. Um, K through 12 responsibilities, both of my parents work K through 12 and they see the burdens that teachers are going through and more and more responsibilities are being put on, on teachers and m teachers now, are, there's a possibility to get less and less education to become a teacher and so we need the highly educated teachers to teach our young uh, citizens in Minnesota. You can't teach if you don't know what you're teaching. And higher education, as mentioned, I believe there should be a tuition freeze. Debts are terrible on college students recently and I graduated last year with around $30,000 worth of debt, so I know the burdens. Steve. Well, first of all, uh, there's a lot of research that shows that any, um, any uh, additional education that's provided to kids at these early years is lost by the time you get to the fourth grade. So um, I don't know that we're um, going in the right direction. We may have our foot on the gas and the brake at the same time. Um, secondly, uh, when we had the all-day kindergarten passed here in Minnesota, we saw huge property in tax increases because of that. Even in the face of the fact that the legislature allocated money uh, to local school districts, it still wasn't enough. Um, if we bring forward mandatory pre-K, uh, we're going to see property taxes skyrocket. And then, you know, the idea of backing the school bus up to the hospital maternity ward room door is not going to strengthen our families. It's going to make families weaker, and it's going to make governments bigger and stronger. Uh, we need to head in the other direction and instill and provide policies that, that strengthen families, not further weaken them. Thank you, candidates. Uh, we're just about through with our forum for this evening, but at this point we would like to ask each candidate to present their one-minute closing remark. Uh, we will begin with Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you to the League and all the co-sponsors for uh, putting this event on. I think it's extremely important to uh, get the public involved in this process. Uh, my philosophy is very simple. People first. People first. Every vote I take, I do so in a way that best represents the people of southeastern Minnesota and is best for the entire state of Minnesota. Now, I want to take a moment right now to plead to Governor Dayton, to Speaker Doubt, and to Majority Leader Bach. Please call us back for special session. Let's get this incredibly important tax bill passed. Let's get a bonding bill passed. Let's do what's right for the people in the state of Minnesota. I am convinced if we listen and we work together, good things will happen for our district and the state. And I look forward to working with all of you to help make southeastern Minnesota and the state of Minnesota a better place to live, work, and raise a family. 
I would really appreciate your vote on November 8th. Thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for tuning in. John. Again, thanks for the opportunity of being here. The reason I'm really doing this whole thing, people ask that question, and it's a good question to ask, why are you doing this? I really do fear for the future of these small towns in this district. Uh, the state has not always been very helpful. Half of all counties in the state have lost half of their government aid from the state. It's, counties can only cut so much, and the rest falls on property tax owners. Uh, again, since I live in Lanesboro, I know. Lanesboro in the last 12 years after inflation has lost 60% of its local government aid from the state of Minnesota. Who pays for that? We do. We pay that for that as businessmen, as farmers, as residents. So I'm going up there to be transparent, to fight for fairness for all of us. Thank you. Mike. Well, again, thank you all for uh, having this event here tonight. I really enjoyed the discussion and the questions. Um, I'm not doing this because I need a job or anything. I'm doing it because I come from a family that we get involved in our communities. My mom and dad, since the time I can remember, have been involved in anything charitable you can think of in Red Wing. Uh, and then for that reason, all throughout the state. Um, and that's why I'm doing this. I want to make, make this community, make southeastern Minnesota the best communities it can be to live in. And people will want to move here. Um, what uh, John just said with property taxes, I just saw mine go up 22.6% in Red Wing. I don't know what Matt's went up, but uh, my personal property tax went up 22.6% with the school referendum as another addition, which I'm glad to pay because we have a beautiful community. But we need to uh, make sure that we are up there working for the people of this district in this southeastern Minnesota. That's what I'll be doing. I'll put the public servant back in public service. Matt. Well, thank you, Stephanie, and event sponsors. I think this has been a great exchange of ideas, and it's important for us to keep things civil uh, as we look at uh, races at the national level. This is uh, really heartening to see the, the level of discourse today. Well, if you look at my body of work in the last four years, I think there's one theme, and that's rural competitiveness. And everything from the state budget uh, to local government aid to school funding to investing in infrastructure and education, there's a theme, and it's rural competitiveness, making sure that we're able to, to, to balance uh, the interests of rural Minnesota with those in the metro area and level the playing field so that we can all prosper. The state has come out of the economic recession fairly well, but there's parts of struggle throughout rural Minnesota. And the things that we're able to do, whether it's education innovation, making college more affordable, focusing on early education, or making our high school years more meaningful, uh, looking at health care affordability, uh, those are incredibly important areas. Broadband, we've extended internet access to over 12,000 Minnesota homes and businesses in the last couple of years. We doubled down on that investment in the last year, and we want to do more in the years ahead. And also focusing on areas like workforce housing and job training. These are the sorts of things that make Minnesota competitive. These are the sorts of things that we've got to be investing in. Thank you. Gene. I would hope the people of Minnesota would ask their legislative candidates how they plan to reform their own process so they can get their work done. And it's as simple as that. In 2015, we couldn't finish special session. In 2016, we didn't finish, and we can't even decide on a special session. A part-time legislature cannot put infinite items into a finite process and expect anything other than a breakdown. And we have broken the system. It needs to be changed, whether that is limiting the number of bill introductions, whether it's the midnight rule, which we should not be able to suspend and committees and floor sessions have to end. Certainly, we do need to have drop dead deadlines for both policy and fiscal committees so that we actually know what we're passing, when we're passing it. And the public has to be made aware also. All of those reforms are possible. We can do them. But the public has to put pressure on legislative candidates. I hope that is one of the results of this election. Elise. Cutting spending and lowering taxes, as Steve has mentioned, is a great answer to how the economy starts to work for you for a 30-second soundbite. But it isn't a long-term solution to growth in Minnesota. This is a broken record that has been played out at the State House over and over. I'm here to talk about being smart with our budget and understanding that we need to fund projects like roads and bridge upkeep so our citizens are safe and able to get to work and run their businesses. I'm sure that when you go to work, if you don't show up or get your job done, you don't get a paycheck or you get fired. How does this work in the real world? It doesn't. With minimal support um, from the House currently and bills at the State House, it's time that we send the Republicans 
packing so we can have someone there who wants hard-earned taxpayer dollars to go where it needs to go and not just holding up a stop sign and trying to get people um, gridlocked every, at every turn. I want to thank everyone for their time here tonight. Um, this is my first forum and I'm glad you've made it out alive. <laughs> um, and I'd like to ask for your vote on November 8th. Steve. Instead of uh, continuing to entrust and strengthen a government that, uh, re that takes the dignity away from working people, uh, we need to have policies that restore the dignity of working people. Instead of having a government that continues to take money from people in, in their paternalistic uh, interest or, or approach to taking care of them, we need to let people keep their own money and people have the ability to uh, spend their own money on their own family instead of having a government that just continues to grow and control them. That's the direction that I have gone. That's a direction I'd like to continue to do. I'm a person who does what he says. And I'm there to fight for uh, somebody that everybody around this table has seen. And that's those little three and four year olds at our parades and what their future is. I want to restore to those people the type of opportunity and hope that we had in our ability to succeed and achieve the American dream here in this state that we had. Thomas. Well, it's pretty clear with the $414 million uh, tax increase this year, uh, things aren't going as planned and we ought to be doing a lot better. So we have a perfect opportunity in this election to uh, look towards the future or continue to do what we've been doing and dismantling local government aid and cutting county program aid and, <clears throat> and, uh, and getting by on, on, our, on, our, on our sound bites. And so what we need to do is focus on uh, rural schools and getting our, uh, from La Crescent to Spring Valley up to par with, with uh, the folks in the metro and in other districts. Uh, we need to fix our roads and bridges. It's a pretty clear choice there. And uh, invest in uh, digital infrastructure too, as Senator Schmidt mentioned, uh, rural broadband. Uh, when just over half of our of Houston and Fillmore County have the speeds that the metro has, we're at a huge disadvantage. And if we want to attract people, get folks to move back, have our kids succeed, succeed, we need to invest in our communities. Thank you very much. We're at the end of our time for this forum. We want to thank all of the candidates tonight for an informative event. The League of Women Voters would also like to thank again our co-sponsors, AAUW Winona Chapter, Project Fine, the Women's Resource Center of Winona, the Winona State University Social Work Students, American Democracy Project, and Student Senate. We would also like to thank HBC for taping this educational forum. Pending the availability of the public access government channels, we do plan to rebroadcast this forum. It will also be available on the League of Women Voters Winona Facebook page within the next few days. Currently on the Facebook page for the uh, League of Women Voters of Winona are the City of Winona and City of Goodview forums that took place last week. We'd also like to share the dates and times of our upcoming League of Women Voters general candidate forums. We have four forums coming up in the next few weeks. We will have two forums in two days on Wednesday, September 14th. At 6 o'clock p.m. will be the forum for the Winona County Commissioners 3rd and 4th districts. And at 7.30 p.m., we will have the Winona County Soil and Water District 2nd, 3rd, and 5th Districts. On Tuesday, September 20th at 7 p.m. will be the Winona Area Public School Board Districts 2, 3, 4, and 5, as well as information on referendum ballot items. And on Tuesday, October 4th at 6.30 p.m., we will have the General Election Forum for the 1st Congressional District. These events will feature televised candidate statements and time for the public present to directly meet the candidates after the televised portion of the evening. All League of Women Voters general election forums will be held here in the Winona City Hall, City Hall Council Chambers throughout the next few weeks. Due to the number of forums, the times do vary, so watch your local media and publicity for updates on all of these opportunities. We are also pleased to announce two League of Women Voters registration events. Um, on Monday, September 19th at 2 o'clock, we will be at the Blue Heron Coffee House here in the city of Winona. And on Wednesday, September 28th, also at 2 p.m., we will be here in Winona at Blooming Grounds. If you need to register to vote or if you change your address, this needs to be done by October 18th of 2016. Join us at the Blue Heron or Blooming Grounds and we can help you do that. League of Women Voters will assist you with online voter registration. You will need to bring your Minnesota driver's license. 
and thank you again to our hosts for, uh, for their locations to assist the public. If you need information on becoming a registered voter, call the Winona County Auditor or the Winona City Clerk. If you are not registered to vote and are planning to vote, you may register to vote online at the Minnesota Secretary of State's office until October 18, 2016 for the general election. You may also register at the polls. Check the Minnesota Secretary of State's website on the process as several forms of identification must be provided on election day to election judges. MNLWV.org is a website you may also use for general voter services information. The League of Women Voters members will also be at several community locations for voter registration assistance. Watch the media for dates and times. Please vote. The general election is on Tuesday, November 8th. The polls are open 7 a.m. through 8 p.m. Thank you all and have a great evening.